Hello, Pastor Tracy here. I'm the assistant pastor here at Calvary Chapel Eastside, and we just want to thank you for streaming this uh, teaching today. We hope that it encourages you, that it builds you up, but most importantly, that it challenges you in your walk with Jesus Christ. Now, we just want to say that we offer these teachings online as an additional resource, in addition to your personal Bible study time and your time at a local church. See, we believe that being a part of a local church is key to your growth, and we believe that it is mandated in God's Word for us to be a part of a local body. So please, be involved in a local body, support a local church. That's very important. Now, if you are not a part of a local church, we would love to invite you to come and be a part of what goes on here at Calvary Chapel Eastside. You can look on our website at cceschurch.com. It'll give you all of the information that you need to know, our background, our service times, and where our location is at. We would love to have you come and join with us, but until then, God bless you, and may God bless you richly. All right, let's turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 2, shall we, in the New Testament? Colossians chapter 2. Nothing new under the sun. This book written nearly 2,000 years ago was to remind us that Satan is a persistent enemy. If he can't come against you from outside, if he can't discourage you through health problems, financial setbacks, or people coming against you, he will do his level best to infiltrate the church and introduce destructive heresies so that people don't get built up in the faith. Uh, he's been telling us uh, about these false teachers that had infiltrated the church at Colossae, uh, a church that Paul had never visited, but Epaphras had heard Paul's preaching up in Ephesus, came back to his hometown, spread the gospel, and started a little home church in, in his own. That's the way it's supposed to work. Because many false teachers now through the ages always appeal to a special body of knowledge that you don't have access to unless you join their group, unless you tap into that spiritual high ground. You just don't have a chance being a regular old ordinary Christian just reading his Bible filled with his Holy Spirit and chasing after Christ. The false teachers always want you to read something else besides your Bible. The false teachers always want to attach more to than what the Word of God says. They want to add to it. The rules are endless. In Jewish circles, uh, they were adding burdens upon people that no man could bear. The Bible in the Old Testament had said, keep the Sabbath, it should be a day of rest. Not resting from the Lord, but resting in the Lord. Worshiping and going to church and singing his songs and, and doing those kind of things. But there were legalists in the Jewish society that said, well, that's not good enough. We have to define what you can and can't do on the Sabbath. And so they had this long list of, of rules and uh, things that you had to do and you, things you could do and things you couldn't do on the Sabbath, none of which is found in the Word of God. But here's the problem with legalism. It always leaves you with a sense of spiritual superiority. And you start defining your spiritual worth in these terms. Well, I don't do this, and I don't do that, and I don't do this. I don't walk more than a 1,000 paces on the Sabbath because I'm a good Jew. I don't wear my false teeth on the Sabbath because they, somebody, Rabbi, told us that that was bearing a burden. So I'm a, I'm a, all of a sudden now you have a metric by which you can feed your own spiritual pride. Well, I did this, I did this, I kept this commandment, I did this rule, blah, blah, blah. Legalism is, will spell the death of any church because it's diametrically opposed to grace. It's not motivated by the Holy Spirit. It's motivated by the dictates of men that think somehow or another adding burdens to you makes you more holy. Can I tell you the law is incapable of making you holy? It pointed out our sin. It did a great job of that. People say, well, Pastor Jim, I think I'm going to heaven because I think I've kept the, the Ten Commandments. Let me follow you around for 24 hours, a legal pad and a pen, and I'll point out to you every single commandment that you break. Jesus said, you say you haven't murdered somebody, but have you ever disliked somebody, ever hated somebody? You say that you haven't committed adultery, really? You ever look at another person lustfully? Well, then you've broken all of those laws. 
And all of this is without excuse. While the law did a great job of diagnosing the problem, it couldn't prescribe a prescription that would fix us. It told us that all have sinned and fallen short the glory of God. We already knew that. We were imperfect. That's not good news. That's being confronted with the bad news that I am who I am, a sinner estranged from God because he's perfect and he's holy and I'm imperfect and I'm unholy. Who bridges that gap? Well, it's not the law that will bridge that gap. It's the person of Jesus Christ. He's the one who died on the cross for my sins, for your sins, for the sins of the whole world. I'm not saved by trying to keep the law or be a goody two-shoes or even adding to the law time and time again. The Jews had added volumes of books called the Talmud, divided into two parts, the Mission and the Gemara, all of which you had to keep these volumes and volumes of rules and regulations. The traditions of men is what Jesus called them. The problem is, is where's the freedom in Christ Jesus in that? Instead, we start defining ourselves, well, I, I don't drink or dance or cuss or smoke or chew or date girls that do, but guess I'm a pretty good Christian. And you start feeling puffed up about yourself because I kept this long list of do's and don'ts. Keeping a list of do's and don'ts doesn't get you into heaven. Jesus Christ and he alone does. So we sing like the songs that we sang this morning of surrender. If you're not surrendered to the lordship of Jesus Christ, I can guarantee you you're not going to heaven. Guarantee. Because you're counting on your good works instead of his completed work. He died on the cross. If there was any other way to be saved than Jesus going to the cross, he wouldn't have gone. But there was no other way. He had prayed that in the garden of Gethsemane. Lord, if there's any other way... He was speaking of the salvation of mankind. We can't save ourselves. The law couldn't save us. It only condemned us. Well, what Paul does in confronting this Jewish legalism and later called Gnosticism, he, he advocates looking at Christ and he points out the supremacy of Christ. He's greater than the law. He was greater than Abraham. He's greater than any of the patriarchs. He's greater than Moses, the lawgiver. He is all we need. Jesus, it's him and him alone. There is no other answer in life. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, Scripture says. But if you're not leaning on him, if, you're, if you don't have that personal walk of intimacy with him, you don't have that hope, you don't have that strength, you don't have that power. He is all sufficient. People today think, well, no, uh, what I really need is counseling. The counselor will tell you you're a hot mess. You pay $200 an hour to have him tell you you're a hot mess. You already knew that. You go to the psychiatrist hoping that maybe there's some pill you can take that will turn around the hot mess of your life. But amongst all of the AMA board certified specialties, the highest rate of suicide is found amongst psychiatrists. They know they don't have the answers. So where does the world turn? Sometimes to drugs, sometimes to alcohol. Sometimes they expect some other human being to fill that God-shaped void in their lives. Only God can fill that void. But we look to a relationship. Oh, if I could just be married to so-and-so. Oh, if I could just be divorced from so-and-so, then I'd be a better Christian. The answer is Christ. Not whether you're single, married, young, or old, rich or poor. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And so Paul makes this argument, especially in chapter 2. We are complete in Christ. Don't try to add to that. I'm complete in Christ, but then you also need this. I'm complete in Christ, but I need to be baptized. I'm complete in Christ, but I, I need to speak in tongues. I'm complete in Christ, but I need to, to go out and win at least 50 people to the Lord before I, I die. Legalistic Jewish proto-Gnostics are still around today. And they say, well, accepting Christ is fine. But do you still do this? Do you still do that? Oh, if you were a good Christian, you wouldn't do X, Y, or Z. These Colossians were being told that you need some secret, special knowledge that's only available to the mystics in our cult. And so, too, the cults today, when they come knocking on your door, two by two, knock on the front door, and they, they prey on Christians that are not well-grounded in the Bible. 
They try to find them because they know new converts are pliable. They know they're Christians, and they can manipulate them. Well, the reading the Bible is fine, but you also need this Watchtower magazine. Oh, the Bible is fine, sure, uh, but, but you also need the Book of Mormon. And then you're going to need the Pearl of Great Price and the Doctrines and Covenants to go with that because the Mormons want you hook, line, and sinker. You say, but Pastor Jim, they seem so nice. If nice got you into heaven, Jesus died for nothing. That's not the price of admission in heaven. Well, they're nice. You can be nice and deceived. Paul reminds these believers at Colossae, and he reminds us that our identity and theirs was in Christ Jesus, him and him alone. And in Christ, I find all of my needs met, my psychological needs, my sociological needs, my spiritual needs. He tells me, first of all, I am accepted. I am a child of God. Because I've got Christ in my heart, I am a child of God. I've been bought with a price, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how much he esteemed you. I'm accepted, thus I have value. My life has meaning. It has purpose. My Bible says I'm a saint. I don't need to kiss the feet of wooden statues in certain churches to, to, and pray through saints in the hope to get to God. I am a saint. How come those wooden statues aren't kissing my feet? If I'm as much a saint as them, oh, I haven't been canonized, but the Bible says I'm a saint. Maybe man-made religion says I'm otherwise, but I know who I am in Christ. I am a saint. I have access to God. I've been redeemed. I've been forgiven all of my sins. I am complete in Christ Jesus. There's nothing that I can add to that. The Bible tells me, secondly, it's reinforced in Colossians here. Secondly, I am secure. I'm secure in his love. I'm secure in the fact I'm going to heaven. And it's not based on my performance, but his. I'm assured in his word because I'm secure. Everything happens for a reason and a purpose. All things work together for the good of those that love God and are called according to his purpose. He didn't ask me to figure out how. He just asked me to trust the promise. That's where faith comes in. I'm free from condemnation. I can never be separated from God's love. That lends a security to my life that the trials of this life can't shake. No attack from the enemy can shake. I've been established, anointed, sealed by God. I'm hidden with Christ in God. I've not been given a spirit of fear or bondage, but a power and love and a sound mind. This is my identity. This is who I really am. Not who my feelings tell me that I am. Or the voice that I hear in my ear of condemnation. It sounds like me, and I wonder, is that me? Or is that Satan? Or is that God? Well, let me narrow down the choice for you. If it's not God, don't pay attention to it. You'll know it's God's voice because it'll be consistent with his word. He'll never condemn you. He'll never fault find with you. He'll never criticize you. I've not been given a spirit of fear or bondage, but of power, love, and a sound mind. The battle's for the mind. Have you noticed that? All sin is committed up here long before it's exercised in the members of your flesh. The battle is won or lost right up here. Are you keeping this thing sanctified? Are you careful with what you allow your eyes to see? Are you careful about what you allow your ears to hear? Are you careful about what kind of speech comes out of your mouth? Does it build up? Does it encourage? Does it edify? If not, it's not from God. You may claim it as your favorite spiritual gift, but if it comes out looking more like criticism than encouragement, that's not a spiritual gift. That's a demonic stronghold. That's in your flesh and needs to die. Thirdly, reminding the believers here and reinforcing it in my life, my life has significance. And it's not because I'm wealthy, I'm not. It's not because I'm better than anybody else, I am not. But the Bible tells me that you and I are the salt and light of the earth. We give flavor and sustenance out there. We shine light in a dark place just by our presence. My life has significance. I'm here for a reason. I'm here. My life has a purpose, and it is to let that light shine. And someday somebody's going to ask you, how come when everybody else around you is losing their head, you're cool? What's that? What's wrong with you? 
say, I'm a Christian. I gave my heart and life to Jesus Christ a long time ago. The Bible describes him as the Prince of Peace. He's my Lord and my Savior. Would you like to know him? See how easy that is? It only took me 10 seconds. You got 10 seconds at work. You got 10 seconds at any point in time in your life to be salt and light. I am just a skinny little branch, but I am tied into the true vine. I've been chosen. I've been appointed to bear fruit because I abide in Christ. The Bible tells me my body is the temple of God. Some temples are round. That's okay. We can't all be sleek. I am God's co-worker. I am God's workmanship, Ephesians tells me. His poema, it's where we get the word poem, but it means more than just a poem. It means a beautiful masterpiece. You are God's beautiful masterpiece. You've probably never thought of yourselves in those terms, but that's your identity in Christ Jesus. That's why when you're in Christ, you're complete. You have every resource that you will ever need. I'm a minister of reconciliation, a herald of the gospel, and we all are in the body of Christ. I am a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I just need Jesus. I am a child of God. I'd like you to take a look at chapter 2 and our lesson this morning. We'll, by way of review, pick it up in verse 9. For in Christ all the fullness, how much is all? In Christ all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ. That's why he's all you need. Everything that you ever thought God was and everything that you didn't know that God was was in Christ Jesus. He's 100% man, 100% God. All of God was in that body of his. And we have been given fullness in Christ. That's your identity. Well, I don't feel like that's my identity. Hmm. Imagine a train. Only three cars. There's the locomotive, the coal car, and the caboose. Which do you think drives the train? Your feelings or the facts upon which your faith rests. That's what drives this train called Christianity, and it can get along just fine without the other two cars behind it. Your faith follows next because of the facts. Jesus is the Son of God, amen? He is the Christ. He is the Messiah, and it's not open to interpretation. He died on the cross, fact. He rose from the dead, fact. The Romans couldn't find him. The disciples couldn't find him. Jews couldn't find him. Body, body, who's got the body? He was raised. He was raised from, deal with it, man. These are facts. That's the bedrock upon which my faith rests. So the coal car in this imaginary train of ours is my faith. Because I'm all a quasi-intelligent person where the facts lead me and where the facts are indisputable. I don't mind putting my faith behind that engine any old day of the week. The facts of who Jesus is, what he came, what he did, what he accomplished. My faith is not just faith for the sake of faith. I'm sure there's Buddhists out there with more faith than me. It's the object of your faith that is everything. The object of my faith is Jesus Christ because Buddha didn't die for my sins. Buddha wasn't crucified and he didn't rise again. Then why would I trust in him? So the facts regarding the historical person, Jesus Christ, you say, well, I'm not sure he's a person of history. Pick up any encyclopedia in the United States of America. Go to any college campus, any encyclopedia. He is a man of history. History. He's attested to by Christian sources, Jewish sources that hated his guts, Roman sources that had no great fondness for Christians either. His own enemies tell us that he was a real, live human being. But more than a man, one of the Roman centurions when he was being crucified said, surely this was the Son of God. A Roman said that. I don't know who you think Jesus is, I'm here to tell you who he is. 
He is Lord. And someday every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. doesn't mean you're going to heaven. It just means that you will be forced to acknowledge the historical person of Jesus and what he came to do. His great love, his tender mercies. For in Christ, verse 9, again, all of the fullness of the deity, God, dwells in bodily form. And you and I have been given fullness in Christ. I don't need the Book of Mormon. I don't need the Watchtower magazine. I don't need other people's secret discipleship classes. I've been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. That's why every knee will bow and every tongue confess someday. When Christ rules over all the nations of this earth, they will see who has all power, all authority, because God dwells in him. Verse 11, in him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, the flesh, not with the circumcision done by hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. So circumcision and baptism, it's the only place in Scripture that the two are portrayed as examples, as symbols, if you will. The verb circumcised there in verse 11 indicates that at some point in time, this work was done for you. Jesus, when he took up residence in your heart, when you confessed to him your sins and repented of them, and ask him to be your Lord and Savior and submitted your life to him, at that moment, the righteousness of Jesus Christ was imputed to you. You didn't earn it. Don't deserve it. I don't have to live up to it because I've already got it. When I got, all, when I got saved, I got all of Christ. He wants all of you and me. Some things are holding you back. I don't know what it is. It's probably different for every person in this room. What keeps you from being the best Christian on planet Earth today? Let me say that again. What's keeping you from being the most spirit-filled, biblically literate Christian in the whole world today? Only you. Only you can hold yourself back spiritually He's want, we got all of Christ when we got saved. He wants all of us. But TV gets in the way and your cell phone gets in the TV and work gets in your way. And then after work, of course, you've got to be a soccer mom and go to 50 games a week. Put 1,000 miles on your car because that's just really important stuff. Our kids won't be developmentally sound unless I take them to soccer and make them do something they hate. Ask your soccer kids sometime, how do you like getting kicked in the face? Is that fun? You like that? Or coming back home with your shins all black and blue and bloodied? Oh, that's fun, Mom. Really enjoy that. But somehow or another, we bought into a type of society that says we need these things. And the Bible says all you need is Jesus Christ. And yet Satan wants you to fill that hole in your life with everything else. So you watch too much TV. You spend way too much time on social media. You, it's like a dog chasing its tail. We're looking for fullness and contentment and satisfaction and not finding it in the things of the world. But we bought the lie of the enemy. That if I just do it more, well, then I'll be satisfied. If I just get more likes, if I just get more of this, if I could just put more video on TikTok, if I could just... When did we let Satan in the church to tell us what our priorities should be? When did we buy into the world's model of what's necessary? Ooh, you need to have the latest iPhone. What's it, like 27 now? iPhone 27, you need this. It's got 15 different lenses on the front. Yeah. For you, it's only $1,500. But you'll need to buy another one 12 months from now. And somehow or another, we've accepted all of that as normal. When in fact, we look a lot more like slaves to a sinful, fallen world who has dictated its priorities to us. Where's the peace? Where's the rest? Where's the confidence we have in Christ? Can I tell you? I would advocate everybody living without a cell phone or a computer for a week. 
Now, did that thought just suffocate you? <laughs> well, a week I threw mine away three years ago. You don't need a cell phone. You don't need to spend $250 a month on cable TV. You need Jesus Christ. Make you a deal. This coming week, read your Bible as many hours as you watch TV or spell or, send or, or spend on your cell phone or media. If you spend three hours a day on social media, try spending three hours a day in the Word of God and in prayer. Maybe throw in some fasting so you can really earnestly seek the Lord. We've bought into a lie from the enemy, just like these precious believers that call us say, bought into a lie. It sounded spiritual. It sounded good. It just wasn't of God. It was of the world. Satan knows if you can't beat them, join them. And so he infiltrated this precious church here, and he has been doing it ever since. They were very legalistic, but Romans 6.14 tells us we're no longer under the law. The law couldn't save. It couldn't restrain your sinful nature or mine. It couldn't sanctify you. The purpose of the law was to show us. It's like a mirror. How many of you spent some time in front of a mirror this morning? I can tell which of you didn't. So could everybody else in the congregation. Why would you do that? Why would you spend time in front of the mirror? Because you don't want to look like a zombie apocalypse. Okay, I get that. That's part of it. You spent that amount of time in the mirror because you care about the way you look. You care about the way you look. The law is a mirror. It shows us all of our sins. It shows us our faults, ideas, our notions, our shortcomings, everything wrong. The law is a mirror. But this morning when I got up and I looked in the mirror, <clears throat> and said, I need to do something with this hot mess. After I got out of the shower, I grabbed a razor. I looked in the mirror, and I said, I need to shave, because the church expects it, not because I wanted to. I want you to know, I did this for you. I'm not normally this pretty. But as I was there shaving, I was looking in the mirror at my condition, but the mirror was powerless to do anything about my unshaven face. That's the law. It shows you who you are, shows you how you fell short, how you missed the Ten Commandments. But the law couldn't sanctify you. It couldn't make you holy. It could point out your faults. It could show you what was wrong, but it was powerless to clean you up. The purpose of the mirror is not so I can shave with it. Uh, trust me on this. I did not yank the mirror off the wall and try to scrape my face with it this morning. That's not the purpose of a mirror. The law is a mirror. It shows you you've fallen short. We have all fallen short. Amen? Just agree to it. You know it's true. I know it's true. Your mama knows it's true. Let's just sink our teeth into that and say, okay, what do I do about that? Well, the law didn't give you any power to do anything about it. It just showed you that you fell short. So in the Old Testament, they had a sacrificial system that covered over their sins because God is gracious. But Jesus Christ came in the fullness of time, Galatians 4, 4 says, and he shed his blood. And you who have accepted Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for your sins are children of God. You're not trying to keep the law. Now you keep the law because that's your nature. You don't think about going out and committing murder and, and doing all of the things that the law condemned that we knew were wrong, but now I've got a power inside of me called Jesus Christ, and I can say no to sin. No, I don't have to go there. I don't have to fall for that. I don't have to take things into my own hands. I don't have to ma ma manipulate. I don't have to steal, etc. You get the idea. The purpose of the law is to show me my condition. The purpose of Jesus coming is to do something about it. Jesus paid the price that your sins and mine deserved. The price has already been paid. Those of us that have submitted to his lordship have found that he opened the prison doors. Remember Peter in the book of Acts? He was put in prison one time. An angel of the Lord showed up at night despite all these guards around. And the angel of the Lord tapped Peter and said, Yo, Peter, get up. Let's go. Peter thought he was having a dream because there was guys that were uh, on either side of him. There were guards at the doors, you know, f full of weapons and what have you. And, 
And, and Peter thought he was having a dream because nobody blinked at him and his angel are walking out of the prison, you know. Then he goes to the house where the disciples were meeting, and he knocked on the door. They had been praying for his release. So when the doorkeeper went to the door and opened up, said, hmm, Peter, she shut the door in his face, went back and told the disciples, oh, it's Peter at the door. And they said, yeah, you must be seeing a ghost. We're praying for his deliverance, but we don't believe it is actually going to happen. But we should pray about it because, you know, that's what Christians do. Not because we're actually expecting God to answer our prayers. Peter kept knocking on the door. Yo, would you let me in? But there are some of us today that Jesus has saved and he's opened the prison doors and released you from your shackles, but you refuse to get up and walk out. He's saved you. He's cleansed you, but you're still in bondage by your own free will and choice. A bondage to 10,000 sins that are, our, that are out there today. doesn't matter which one you're in bondage to. But Satan wants to keep you in bondage. But some of us sit in that jail. Well, I know God loves me. I've been baptized. I'm good. Joined the church. Gave my heart to Christ. But you're still in bondage. Drugs, alcohol, lust, greed, material. What is? I don't know. But I know there are a lot of Christians today that are in bondage. One of the ways I know is because when the altar is open and the Holy Spirit is moving through here, Every single person should be on their knees or on their face or at the altar or confessing sin to a brother or sister that they need to get right with. And when they prefer to white-knuckle hang on the seat in front of them and refuse to let the Holy Spirit of God deal with your heart, I know that there's some bondage. Don't know what yours is, but you need to realize Christ died to set you free. And those the Son sets free are free indeed. We're no longer slaves to our sinful, fallen nature. The old sin nature, it wasn't eradicated. We can still sin, if you hadn't noticed. <laughs> but I do recall that 1 John 1 says this, This is the message that we have heard from him, from Jesus, and we declare to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim that we have fellowship with him and yet continue to walk in the darkness of sin and bondage, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus. His son purifies us from all sin. Now, if you and I claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins as a child of God, if you confess it when you, when you mess up, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim that we have not sinned, we make him, God, out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. Stop saying, I'm not so bad. I don't know what in the world standard you're using to think that you are not so bad, but the standard is Jesus Christ. It's not the world. Well, I'm not as bad as Hitler. Oh, I am glad. That does not make you a righteous person. My dear children, I write this to you. Start of chapter 2 in 1 John. The beloved apostle writes, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. You've been set free. The shackles are off. Get out of the cell. But if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also the sins of the whole world. The power of sin is broken as we yield to Christ and walk in the power of his Holy Spirit. Those bondages that once shackled us are gone. Jesus died to deliver us from those bondages, from those shackles, if you will. Verse 11, back in Colossians 2, in him you were also circumcised spiritually. doesn't matter if you're circumcised physically, but has there been an excision of the flesh? Has God cut that part out of you that belonged to the world? 
In him you were circumcised in the putting off of the old sinful nature, but not with a circumcision done by the hands of men. It's a spiritual circumcision. Do you see what he's saying? He's equating circumcision here with the rite of Christian baptism. They're symbols. God really couldn't care less if you're, if you're circumcised or not, but let Jesus do a circumcision of your heart. That's a surgery every single one of us need. Having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. Mm. Paul's using the word baptism here symbolically just like he is circumcision. It's a, he's using it in a figurative sense in this portion of his letter because no amount of physical, literal water can make you alive in Christ. So he must be using the term symbolically, otherwise you'd need to stay in that baptismal bath for the rest of your life. Our spiritual burial and resurrection with Christ is pictured best in complete immersion baptism. I know that some of you came from a religious uh, denomination where they sprinkled you or maybe poured a bowl of, of water over your head. But biblically, baptism means total and complete immersion. It was used in the dyeing industry of a garment or a piece of leather that you dipped completely in the dye and held it under until the whole thing was stained that new color. So that's what baptism pictures for you. Now, can you be saved and not baptized? If you're baptized in Christ, all your bases are covered. Physical baptism in a church can't save you. No amount of water can save you. Only Jesus Christ can. But I know that some of you have traditions that say, well, I was told that you couldn't go to heaven unless you were baptized. What about the thief on the cross? Jesus told him, today you'll be with me in paradise. Sounds like he was saved. When did he get baptized? He didn't. Should you get baptized as a Christian? Of course you should, because it's a public declaration of your faith in the death and burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's a symbol. It doesn't save you. It's a symbol that identifies you with him. It was the power of God that changed us. It wasn't the power of water. That's to be sure. Verse 13, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature. This is the old you. This is B.C. days before Christ. God made you alive with Christ at some point in time. He saved you. You gave your heart and your life to him. You confessed your sins. You repented. He, he forgave and washed away all of your sins. He forgave us all of our sins. Verse 14, having canceled the written code. That's the Old Testament law. Now, I know some people will brag to you, well, I've kept the Ten Commandments my whole life. One guy tried that with Jesus, and he said, well, I've kept all these commandments my whole life. Now, his God was money, so Jesus addressed that one. But quite frankly, the written code, not just the Ten Commandments that condemned every one of us, some people, when they have told me, well, I've kept the Ten Commandments my whole life, I'll go, great. Did you know there's 603 other Jewish rules and regulations you also had to keep? Perfectly, from the womb to the tomb. Nobody has ever managed that one except Jesus. So you either believe in him and appropriate his righteousness or you stand in your sins. And there is an eternal price to be paid for that. Why would you trample underfoot the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ who loves you and gave his life for you so that you could stand before God someday in your sins? Do you know what all of those 603... Other Jewish rules and regulations are besides the Ten Commandments. Can I give you some of them? Condemn us all. Anybody in here ever had shrimp? Scallops? Lobster? King crab. Got to die and go to heaven to buy that stuff anymore. You're going to hell. If you're counting on the law to save you, you're going to hell. Catfish? Anybody ever had any catfish? Jimmy Dean pork sausage? That's the bread of heaven, I'm thinking. But then I'm not Jewish. The Jewish dietary laws, you had to keep all of that. 
because it set them apart as the people of God. So they had very unique dietary laws that simply do not apply to you and I. <laughs> Thankfully, yeah. I'm thanking my Jimmy Dean pork sausage for that. When you were dead, verse 13, in your sins and uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all, say all, all our sins, having canceled that written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. And he took it away, nailing it to the cross. Now, you have to understand in Roman times, what they did is if they were going to crucify somebody, they carried a wooden plaque with the guy's capital crime on it. And then when they, when they hung him up to crucify him, this titleless, as they called it in the Latin language, was nailed above his head. So everybody could see what crime he was guilty of. What was Jesus' crime when he was crucified? This is Jesus, the Son of God. That's his crime? Yeah. There was no sin found in him. Nobody could find sin in him. But all of the things that were against me that I was accused of, it was nailed Above Jesus' head. So when he died, it wasn't for his own sins. It was for yours and mine. Thus, all of our sins have been washed away. Jesus, King of the Jews, Matthew 27, 37, tells us, but he did more than just pay the price our sins deserved. Look at verse 15. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, interesting word in the original Greek, not only did God cancel the accusations of the law against the Christian, he also conquered and disarmed Satan, the accuser of the brethren, Satan and all of his fallen angels. He disarmed them and the authorities, the powers and authorities. He made a public spectacle over them, triumphing over them by the cross. In other words, he humiliated Satan and his fallen angels. That's what he accomplished on the cross for us triumphing over them by the cross. So everything revolves around Christ, doesn't it? What he accomplished for us. Colossians 1.16 had told us formerly, for by him, Jesus, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. Interesting, Muhammad never claimed, made a claim like that, or Buddha or Confucius or any of the Hindu deities. So why do people believe in a lie? Because they don't want to give up their sin. They're more than willing to accept any religious symbol that promises them an eternal hope and requires them to give up nothing. People thinking they can buy their way into heaven or if they believe hard enough. In Ephesians 6, in verse 12, we're told, for our struggle, your struggle and mine is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world. This is Satan and his demons and the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. That's our responsibility day by day. Put on the helmet of salvation. It guards your mind, the breastplate of his righteousness, the belt of truth, always speaking the truth, in love, holding high the shield of faith, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel, always holding the, and swing back and forth the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's why you need to be in the Word of God. Every time Jesus was tempted, he always quoted the Word of God. Do you? Or do you just go, well, maybe, well, well, well. You've already lost the battle. The battle's for the mind. You've already lost. The Bible says, take captive every thought, make it obedient to Christ Jesus. Jesus, help me. I, I'm weak. I'm being tempted. Help me, Lord. Pray the prayer, and he will. But the picture here is of conquered soldiers stripped of their clothing as well as their weapons, humiliating them to the uttermost. It symbolizes a degrading and total defeat over the enemy. Now, there's a practical application as we wrap up chapter 2. Therefore, verse 6, because of all that Jesus has done for us, because of all that we've been given in Christ Jesus, he says, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or 
with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Therefore, don't let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen and his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. Boy, there's a spirit of judgment in the churches today. When I first got saved, I got saved in a very conservative Baptist church in Oklahoma City. And if you were a good Christian, you don't listen to country music. I didn't read that in the Bible anywhere, but I was told, no, you don't do that. I had some Pentecostal holiness friends that say, we don't even listen to the radio. And I kept hearing all of the things that these good Christians don't do. I didn't hear that they were doing anything. I just heard all the things they don't do, assuring them of their salvation. It sounded very legalistic to me. And they judged everybody that wasn't just like them. That's the tendency of the flesh. Well, if you're not a part of our church, you can't really be saved. Or maybe you're going to heaven, but you'll be on the back row. Us Calvary Chapelites, while we're, we occupy the first thousand rows. Who said, where does it say that in the Word of God? But that kind of spiritual snobbery can be running each other. Well, where do you go to church? Like, my church is better than your church. How infantile that sounds. We're a part of the body of Christ. It's global. Meets in a zillion different locations. But let's not pit one church against another. Let no man judge you. The warning exposes the danger of legalism of these Gnostic teachers that call us say, but have you noticed how our human nature thrives on rules and rituals and religious regulations? The flesh is weak when it comes to doing spiritual things, Jesus told his disciples, but boy, our flesh is pretty strong when it comes to practicing a long list of spiritual do's and don'ts. Well, I don't do this. I don't do that. What do you do? Do you love Jesus? Do you share your faith? Do you read your Bible? Do you pray? Do you worship? I don't care about what you don't do. Those things don't get you into heaven. Adhering to religious routine, however, leads to an arrogant ego. Well, look at me. I don't do those things. I don't drink. I don't cuss. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. You're not the subject at hand. It's, it's all about Jesus. It's not about you. But do you see how re- this spirit of legalism can lead to a puffed up spiritual pride? Well, I'm better than so-and-so because I don't do his sins. Well, I'm better than this person. The only standard is Jesus Christ. Adhering to religious routine, all it does is inflate the ego and makes a person content in his own self-righteousness. You just need to know that's an abhorrent thing in the eyes of God. Some say, Paul says, you know, some people are telling you you're going to have to keep these Jewish festivals, the new moon celebrations, the Sabbath day. Some say the Sabbath day has not passed away. We should be going to church on Saturday because that was the Jewish Sabbath. Any Orthodox Jews in here this morning? Then it doesn't apply to you. Four times in the book of Exodus, God says, I am making the Sabbath as a covenant between me and Israel. If you're not an Orthodox Jew, it doesn't apply to you. You're Gentile. We're the Gentile bride of Christ. Let me just share these four points briefly with you. The Sabbath command is the only one of the Ten Commandments not repeated in the New Testament. It was a covenant between God and Israel, not the Gentile bride of Christ. Exodus 31, verses 12 through 17. God four times says, it's a covenant between me and Israel this Sabbath was, and yet I have had legalistic, though well-meaning, Seventh-day Adventists come in here and say, you know, Pastor Jim, you're going to hell because you don't worship on Saturday. Well, can you give me chapter and verse for that, brother? Can I tell you, by the way, you don't have the gift of encouragement. 
Secondly, the early believers following Christ's resurrection and appearance on Sunday habitually met on Sunday thereafter, and the church has been meeting on Sunday ever since. I'm, we're not a Sabbath-keeping church because you ain't Jewish. Besides that, that old covenant has passed away. Thirdly, this Colossian passage explicitly condemns those that would command Sabbath obedience. But I've had well-meaning people get right in my face about why we don't meet on Saturday. Sabbath means what? Rest. What do I think you should do on every Sabbath? Rest. Take every Saturday off. Tell your wife, honey, I would love to mow the lawn, but it, it's the Sabbath. Uh, you know, I have, I, have to, I, have to, I have to rest. Of course, you'll then also have to keep all of the other 600 plus rules and regulations of the Jewish law. Paul puts it this way that the Sabbath was only a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality of the substance, however, is found in Christ. So what the Old Testament foreshadowed, we find fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The Old Testament promised us a Sabbath rest. We find our spiritual rest in Christ Jesus. So the type has been fulfilled. The, the law reveals sin and warns of the consequences of sin, but it, it had no power to prevent sin or redeem the sinner. Only grace can do that. Only Christ can do that. So he says in verse 18, don't let anybody who delights in false humility, that's the person who's telling you how good a Christian they are and how far you fall short. That's the legalist that says, you can't be a Christian and still smoke. You can't be a Christian and, and, and imbibe in alcohol. Well, some of you should not. If you've come from a uh, background of abuse in any of these areas or something had an addictive hook into you, you shouldn't have anything to do with it whatsoever. But don't lay a guilt trip on others that may have the freedom or feel the freedom to do that. Let it go. Stop being the Holy Spirit. Let God convict others of sin. That's not your job. Your job is to build up, encourage, and edify. We all fall short. But doesn't the Bible say love covers a multitude of sins? So if a brother or sister is exercising more freedom than you feel comfortable doing, that's fine. Don't judge them for it. Let it go. Let it go. Can you be saved and still listen to country western music? I think so. You may not like it, but that doesn't give you the right to dictate your feelings about it to anybody else. But we do that all the time because Satan knows if he can plant a spirit of judgmentalism and criticism in a church, he can destroy a church. Once we tolerate that cancer, it spreads like a Colorado wildfire. It hurts people, makes people feel inadequate. Don't let anybody, verse 18, who delights in false humidity and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen and his unspiritual mind puffs him up. Pride, spiritual pride. That's why I hate legalism. It always comes with a double dose of pride, a person feeling spiritually superior. That person, verse 19, has lost connection with the head from whom of the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why, as though you still belonged to the world, do you submit to its rules? Some people tell you, well, don't handle that, don't touch that, don't taste that. If the Bible doesn't say that, we shouldn't either. We need to be careful about letting legalism in any of its forms make its way into our, our fellowship. You let the Holy Spirit guide and direct you, but don't play the Holy Spirit to somebody else. Do you know when you sin? Or do you need me to point it out for, to you? I don't do a good job of being the Holy Spirit, but he does a great job, and he's so tender and so kind. You already know there's things in your life that need to change. So do I. I don't need you to remind me. We all fall short, the glory of God. Where's the grace? Where's the love? Where's the mercy? Well, I just want to make you a better Christian. Let God do that. That's not your job. Let God do that. As we spend more time in his word and in worship and in prayer and in fellowship, we become better people, don't we? That's when God has the upper hand in, on my life and he keeps the old nature under control. 
But there are always going to be those. Verse 21. Do you know, it says don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. Do you know how many times I've been condemned for eating hot dogs? Pastor Jim, don't you know they're not good for you? I don't care. Don't care. Well, haven't you ever read the back of the package? Why on earth would I ever want to read the back of the package? I don't care what's in it either. Do I like the way they taste? Absolutely. There's nothing better than a fine foot-long chili cheese coney. I don't care what you say. Don't judge me, man. Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. Uh, yeah, that sounds all holy, does it? But it's contrived. These are all destined to perish with use because they're based on human commands and teaching. Such legalism needs to die. I'd prefer it die sooner rather than later. Such regulations indeed have the appearance of wisdom. Oh, he's so holy. He doesn't drink or dance or chew or date girls that do. Ooh. Mm. Is that the standard of holiness? And their self-imposed worship, their false sense of humility, their harsh treatment of the body. I lay on a bed of nails every night. Ain't I holy? Do you? Do you lay on a bed of nails? Do you deny the flesh? Really? But you're not as holy as me. Harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value to restrain sensual indulgence. You can lay on a bed a day of nails for all eternity and it won't help control your flesh. You know, these prohibitions seem to take the Old Testament ceremonial law to a ridiculous extreme, which seems godly on the front. It seems strict and harsh, and maybe that'll make me more holy. That doesn't lead to holiness. It leads to legalism and bondage. What a lie was foisted upon these early Colossian believers. Where's the grace? Where's the freedom? I'm going to close with this, this one example of how legalistic the exercise of religion can be. I don't know what your religious background is. I am not here to offend in any way, shape, or form. That is not my intent. I'm simply sharing something with you because I've been to seminary and I know what they train seminarians to do. This is an example of religion at its worst. The elaborate ritual of the Mass... I was a Roman Catholic at one time. The elaborate ritual of the Mass is designed to reenact the experiences of Christ from the Last Supper in the upper room through His agony in the garden, the betrayal, trial, crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. The Mass is a drama crowding the detailed events of many days into the space of but one hour or less. For its proper performance, the priest in seminary goes through long periods of training and needs a stellar memory. And here's why. Witness the following. The priest must make the sign of the cross exactly 16 times. He has to turn towards the congregation no more, no less than six times. He has to lift his eyes to the heavens 11 times. He kisses the altar eight times, folds his hands exactly four times, strikes his breast 10 times, bows his head 21 times, genuflects eight times, bows his shoulder seven times, blesses the altar with the sign of a cross 20 times exactly, no more, no less, lays his hands flat on the altar 29 times, prays secretly 11 times, but openly 13 more. Takes the bread and wine, turns it into the body and blood of Christ, covers and uncovers the chalice a total of 10 times and goes to and fro on the podium exactly 20 times. Do you feel the freedom? I am dead serious. This is what they teach Catholic seminarians. They've got to do it this way. Now, none of that is in the Bible. None of that is in the Bible. Oh, you've got to do it this many times. But you take that religious spirit upon you and think that that somehow or another blesses God because I have done the prescribed rituals. It just doesn't set you free. It doesn't forgive your sins. It doesn't wash you. It doesn't give you a new nature. There's a lot of problems with it. So we substitute religious ritual for a thriving relationship with Jesus Christ. The only problem with religious ritual is it can't save. Religious people by the droves are going to make their way to hell because they did it all without Christ. 
you need to think that through. Why do I act the way I do? Am I trying to impress somebody? Am I going through rote and ritual that, quite frankly, is tedious and tiresome? Or do I, do I look to God and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, without counting the number of times I strike my breast? Do I pray without regard to how many times my hands are on the altar or whether I pray in Latin or not? Do you know Latin? Are you blessed when somebody speaks Latin in a sermon? I'll give you some Latin. You can take this one home with you. Idominus vobiscum eat your biscuits. Okay, the last half of that was made up, but first half was legit. I don't want ritual. I want Jesus. I want him to wash me and cleanse me, and I want him to wash me and cleanse me every day. I want to worship him. I want to seek his face. I want to know that I'm loved, that I'm accepted. I want to be reinforced in the knowledge that I'm going to heaven. My life has meaning and purpose, and we're on a good path. That's what mankind needs these last days. 